Okay, good morning everybody and welcome to this, the October meeting of the Housing Planning and Environment Overview and Scrutiny Committee. We've got a lot on our agenda today, so we'll crack on. We have had apologies from councillors Andrew Morgan and Michael Wynne Stanley, and I'd like to welcome our substitute today, Councillor Fred Walker, and any other substitutes? I don't think we have any. Um, Chair's announcements. Uh, you will see, members will have seen that item 6A has been added to the agenda. Item 6A is on the congestion work that's going on because this is such a big issue affecting all of our residents. I agree to it coming on even though it was issued late. Um, stern words were had about the lateness of it and will continue to be had while late items are submitted. But it's an important item, which is why it's on the agenda. Item three, does any member have a, anything to declare, any interest to declare or any? Okay. Uh, is it your wish that we agree the minutes of the last meeting? Lovely. And I think all of those items there are covered in that. Housing vision, welcome to Mayor Paul Dennett and Steve Fife, who are here for item five. We've got the vision, the housing vision paper that's been submitted as part of our papers, and I'm sure you'll want to update the committee on uh, the latest, the very latest, on the status of the Greater Manchester Spatial Framework. Mayor Dennett. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, first of all, I guess I'll deal with the Greater Manchester Spatial Framework um, issue, debacle, however you want to look at this. Um, you'll be aware that the Office for National Statistics have recently published their subnational housing projections. And what colleagues in the combined authority have done is they've ran through um, the current methodology for local housing need that the government are operating, the latest subnational housing projections. And what this information is telling us is over a 20 year period within Greater Manchester, as it stands using the ONS's data set, there'll be a need for around 58,000 less households or homes um, within Greater Manchester. So government have responded to this by telling us or certainly giving us the indication that what they intend to do is consult further on the objectively assessed housing needs methodology or the local housing needs methodology. Now, we've obviously been in continual dialogue with the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government civil servants around all of this because as you all will appreciate we're in the middle of strategic planning here within greater manchester through the spatial framework and also through the district's associated local plan endeavors and having absolute clarity around some of these numbers is critical for the direction of travel here within greater manchester so we had an indication that the week following um, the recent Conservative Party conference that government would be giving us an indication of this consultation on the objectively assessed housing need for the whole of the country. That still has not happened and we are in continual dialogue with government to come forward as quick as they possibly can with absolute clarity around housing numbers for the purposes of our local planning process in the districts, in the 10 districts of Greater Manchester, and all for, also for the Greater Manchester Spatial Framework. I'm aware that this week even Eamon Boylan was talking to, to, to civil servants, senior civil servants on this issue, and I think Chris has only just come off a, a conference call with the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government to see if there's any further updates. We need clarity and we need clarity as quick as possible. You'll be aware that the combined authority around a week ago now um, issued a statement on the website of the Greater Manchester Combined Authority just to make it absolutely clear what's happening here. We've already delayed, as you know, off the back of the subnational population projections that the ONS have produced. We didn't anticipate this significant drop. Um, I do need to draw members' attention to some of the strange anomalies coming out of the methodology um, in the ONS um, um, data set, the latest one on the subnational housing projections. One anomaly, for example, is that Cambridge needs to demolish eight homes a year. So I think there are questions being raised about the efficacy of the methodology. Other issues as well being raised about the methodology that the ONS are using is that they've looked at it over two census periods. And over those two census periods, we actually had 
the financial crash of 2007-2008, which I'm sure as many colleagues in the room know, um, brought the construction industry in this country to somewhat of a standstill in terms of the delivery of, of homes. I think there is obviously a, a question to ask ourselves whether or not just looking at, at this issue in, for strategic pl planning purposes over a, a short period of time in the grand scheme of things, whether that's an effective way of, of doing strategic planning. But needless to say, fr from our perspective, we're, we're lobbying and pushing the government virtually every day to come forward as quick as they possibly can with a new methodology to calculate the objectively assessed housing need for, for the country, but for our purposes for, for Greater Manchester. So other than that update, I, I've got nothing further to tell you unless Chris has been told what Greater Manchester's number is on the, the conference call you were recently on. I don't know. Probably not. Not. Okay. I think <laughs> it might be worth, members will be expecting the publication of the next draft of the spatial framework in the coming days. Hmm. Is it possible that so, clarity is given in the coming days? So what I can update um, colleagues on in connection with that is obviously leaders are also um, really eager to understand what's happening here and we've been updating leaders across the 10 local authorities on a regular basis as well. Um, next week, leaders will be meeting to consider the latest position that the government still hasn't come forward with um, the latest numbers because we were anticipating this week to probably get clarity on what the local housing need numbers are for Greater Manchester. We are not in a position to confirm that and I need to brief leaders on these latest developments with a view to hopefully giving Greater Manchester and, and certainly the elected members in Greater Manchester absolutely more clarity on how we take this forward. So next, next week leaders will be meeting to discuss this issue and further updates will, will emerge from that meeting. Councillor Walker, I, I'm, we've got a really full agenda yeah. and I'm really keen that we get to the end yeah. of it. So a very brief yeah, question this, if you have one. This is a, this is a massive for us all of course. Is it 58 less, 58,000 less than the original projection or 58,000 less than now? So, as you know, we were working to a number of, of 211,000 over the period of the spatial framework. So what this has come back and told us is we need 58,000 less homes over the period of the spatial framework compared to what we were already planning for. Uh, Use your mic, Councillor Walker, sorry. The 250 is down to 150, 160, something. Yeah, yeah. Councillor Gunther, a very brief question, if you can. Um, it's just um, paragraph 4.4. Councillor Gunther, sorry, hold on. We've just done the spatial framework. Mayor Dennett will now do the um, housing vision. So if you could hold your question on the oh, paper, yeah, yeah. that would be great. Lovely. Please go ahead. Okay. So talking to the housing vision now. Um, uh, I think we've um, dealt with the GMSF. Okay, so <laughs> the housing vision in many respects is about responding to the housing crisis we see both within Greater Manchester and, and nationally. And I think it's quite useful just to give you some level of understanding of what I mean by a housing crisis. Um, so I'll give you some key statistics really to, to hopefully help us understand what we're talking about. So at the moment within Greater Manchester, we have 85,636 people on our housing waiting list. 24,043 of those are considered to be in reasonable preference. In 2017-18, there were 3,428 households accepted as being homeless and in priority need within Greater Manchester. And that is an increase of 85% on records recorded in 2009-2010. The numbers of people sleeping rough in Greater Manchester has increased from 41 in 2010 to 268 in 2017, an increase of 554%. Then we also look at right to buy. So since the legislation was brought in in 1980, 92,612 homes have been purchased under right to buy. And what we know nationally from analyses that have been undertaken 
is that approximately 40% of homes purchased under right to buy often find their way into the private rented sector. And since 2012, within Greater Manchester, we've lost 5,699 social homes through right to buy. And at the same time, no homes have actually been delivered within Greater Manchester for social rent using right to buy receipts. And then in terms of temporary accommodation, um, in 2017 and 18, there were 2,102 households in temporary accommodation in Greater Manchester. That is a 347% increase on levels recorded in 2009-10. So I hope that really gives you a feel of what we're talking about here when we're talking about a housing crisis. And at the moment, we certainly know through the national planning policy framework that the government have brought in that we do not have enough truly affordable housing coming through our planning committees up and down the country. Affordability is a key issue seemingly facing many, many parts of the country. The housing vision document that you've got before you today is to complement the Greater Manchester Spatial Framework. It will sit alongside it. It will also be a precursor to the Greater Manchester Housing Strategy which we hope to launch um, towards the end of this year. This is also a document that helps Greater Manchester with its commitment within the Greater Manchester strategy to ensure we have safe, decent and affordable homes across the whole of Greater Manchester. It's concise and it's fairly high level, you could probably argue, but it ultimately is a statement of our collective ambitions for Greater Manchester for the future of housing across the city region. I've already talked to you about the housing crisis and obviously the government have even acknowledged that themselves in their white paper fixing our broken housing market. But I think the housing vision is about speaking to all members of Greater Manchester, be they young people wanting to establish a family or get on the property ladder, though it's also about tackling rough sleeping and homelessness. It's also about supporting older people within Greater Manchester to live independently or if they want to, what we often refer to these days as, as right size. But it's also about connections. And, you know, one of the things I'm often reminded of is housing sits at the base of Maslow's hierarchy of need. It's a fundamental human right. It provides stability to people's lives. And I think we mustn't forget that. And obviously, we're being ambitious here in terms of driving forward with an agenda for safe, decent, affordable, secure, warm, and dry homes. These are the things that you would think would naturally happen in a civilized society. But it seems in 21st century Britain, we have to reaffirm our commitment to some of those basic aspects of, of life. It is about providing children with the best start in life. It is about the relationship between what we want to do economically and what role housing plays in that within Greater Manchester. It is about encouraging more independent living and also it's about the relationship with the health agenda within Greater Manchester. I'm just mindful of some of the work coming out of Greater Manchester's Health and Social Care Partnership which talks about the urgent need for supported accommodation across Greater Manchester. It's also about connecting it into the Green Summit work, which I know Councillor Gonotis in Stockport has been doing an absolute fantastic job on. And that's about insulating homes, energy efficiency, and also reducing our carbon footprint within Greater Manchester. I won't go into the technical detail. I think Steve can answer any questions you might, might have about that. But this is very much a, a high-level vision document. It also talks about the homes we currently have and where we want to go for the future. Affordable housing is very much at the heart of this vision document. And it also talks about the homes we need. This is about right homes in the right place. And I just want to tease out the absolute importance here of placemaking. Often we use this term, but what do we actually mean by it? Placemaking, for me, is about connecting housing to transport public transport infrastructure. It's about thinking about how communities socialise and the role that housing and design plays in that. And it's about establishing thriving communities very much at the heart of Greater Manchester, 
which means we have to think about green spaces across the whole of Greater Manchester and our green infrastructure, schools, health, and all the other kind of institutional assets that are really important for a functioning society. So I can end on that, and if there's any further technical questions about this, I'm sure Steve can answer them, but happy to take questions. Thank you very much, and thank you for being brief. I will ask uh, a couple of very brief questions. Well, first comment to make is it's really good to hear you talk about older people. I think lots of the time when we talk about uh, housing, people talk about people getting their first foot on the ladder rather than people who need the right accommodation uh, towards the, uh, their more mature years. Uh, you talk in the paper about devolution and more devolution being needed, and I wonder if you could just unpack that a little bit. Um, and then also you talk about GM Place, which I think we've talked about at this committee before and about the role that that plays in interacting with the 10 local authorities and just talk a little bit about that or if somebody else is better placed, happy to hear from them. Sure. Um, so first of all, take the, the point about older people. Um, at the end of the day, our approach to housing, our strategy has to consider everyone within Greater Manchester and no one should be, be left out of our endeavours there. Um, older people, obviously, within Greater Manchester, by and large, are, are owner-occupiers, generally, if we look at the data and the statistics when we're looking at comparing ages. But what, what's really interesting about this, and there's some work done in, in Liverpool City region recently, is older people in the north of the country tend to be asset-rich but cash-poor. And what I mean by that is they have a lot of their wealth tied up in their property assets, but that isn't necessarily the same in the south of the country. There are huge differences. So some of this is about how do we support older people in later life to actually realize a, a housing model that works for them. We understand the absolute importance of trying to keep people in their communities, in their functioning communities, where they have social bonds and social ties. So I think the challenges for us within Greater Manchester is how do we achieve that? whilst also addressing some of the issues that older people face within, within the housing market. This isn't about forcing people to move out of their own homes. This is about working with them to consider alternatives. And I think we need to be absolutely clear on that. Um, in terms of devolution, um, the ask in the paper kind of references, I guess, where we got to um, with regards to the housing deal. You'll be, you'll be re reminded that um, we were asking government for £8 million of revenue funding for Greater Manchester through the housing deal. And as you remember, they were encouraging us to go for a slightly higher housing number beyond the objectively assessed housing need to land that deal for Greater Manchester to enable us to forge ahead with a brownfield first strategy and also to tackle issues of infrastructure, land remediation, assembly, all that sort of stuff. So at the moment, because of the situation around the spatial framework, we still do not have clarity on whether or not Greater Manchester is going to receive a housing deal from government. So that £8 million pounds we've previously talked about and considered um, has absolutely not been clarified at this point in time. That's really important. It's really important for a number of reasons. I mean, I can speak from my own local authority's perspective. Since 2010, my city council has lost £198 million pounds as a consequence of austerity, direct cuts to the revenue support grant and increased budget pressures um, that are often unfunded. So having capacity and having skills within Greater Manchester is absolutely critical to forge ahead with a lot of what we're talking about here, both in terms of spatial planning, but also in terms of the forthcoming housing strategy. Homes England and the government, I understand, acknowledge that. And obviously, the arrangement we have within Greater Manchester is different to the arrangement in the GLA in London, where Homes England at the time was actually collapsed into the GLA. And that was at a time that Homes England hadn't seen the level of cuts it had seen after that. So for me, devolution is about a revenue ask of government. It's also about establishing a strategic relationship with Homes England and government in terms of how we move forward. It's also about things like one public estate, because the assumption here is that you know, land is controlled by the state. Well, we know that that simply isn't the case. You know, not all local authorities are land rich. It simply isn't isn't the case. So working with the NHS, working with people like Highways England, working with Network Rail and a whole host of other landholders, including Homes England themselves, 
is very much part of that strategic devolutionary ask um, in the interests of the people of Greater Manchester. Um, in terms of Greater Manchester Place, um, I guess the, the, the work that's been happening through the Reform Board speaks very much to that agenda of integration, thinking across, if you like, service silos to how we consider things systemically. Um, for me, Greater Manchester Place, as I've already highlighted, is about the relationship between housing, transport, green infrastructure, placemaking, the sociology of places, and how we can bring all of that together in a strategic way that ensures our commitment within the Greater Manchester strategy to decent, affordable, safe homes within Greater Manchester. Colleagues probably in other areas of the combined authorities' work might be better to respond from their perspectives, but certainly from my portfolio's perspective, I see it as a strategic approach across all portfolio activity to creating communities that do function, do work, and we can all be proud of. I've got Councillor Gunther and then Councillor Booth. Okay, Lisa, thank you, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Um, I, I have, I've, for whatever reason, I, I seem to have been involved in housing quite a lot during my council career, for whatever reason. Um, I do have a, I have a few questions. One, one specific, or a couple specifically to homelessness, which I think would be better addressed under item six. Um, but what I do want to say is, you've, you've stressed the need or the shortage of homes. Now, we do have a considerable number of empty homes within the Greater Manchester area. We have 2,500 within Bury. Within Greater Manchester, there is considerably more, and, and even more nationally. Uh, I would have thought more, the, greater, the greatest, no, have it to work. The absolute amount of effort should be put into bringing these homes back in, in, into operation be, for, for no better reason than they very often cause a blight to, to surrounding properties. And also, um, in paragraph 4.4, you lay out a vision, really, of what you want, all of which is commendable. But um, the one, two, three, fourth bullet, po bullet point, no, sorry, the fifth bullet point, to better meet the needs of our, our increasing older population. Well, yeah, that's, that's, that is commendable. But very often, when somebody's been in a house for 30, 20, 30, 35 years, and they've brought up a family in the house, and, and the house contains a lot of memories, and say it's a, no, a three-bedroomed house, there is a great reluctance for those people to move out. And the, the, other, the other point is, you know, I, I'm no, one more than, no one wants decent homes more than I do, and, and I think the decent homes policy was a good one that ended in 2010. I, 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 th I think that, that was a reasonable policy. But it is a two-way sword. And it does need the cooperation of the tenants as well. Because without wishing to sound unkind to anybody, I go around some estates and really the, the, the council tenants, the council properties are not always treated with respect. That doesn't always apply to council properties, by the way. It, it can apply to any property. But I, but I do think it's, it's a two-way, so, a, a two-edged sword. And, and it, it, it does require the, the cooperation of tenants and, and landlord. Okay. There's, there's a lot in that. Um, the, the first point on homelessness, I think we'll take in, in the next paper, if that's okay, because I don't think there was a, spe yeah, I don't think there was a specific question there, was there? You're just drawing attention to that. Um, in terms of shortage of, of homes and specifically drawing attention to empty homes, you'll be aware that there is no longer an empty homes initiative um, coming out of the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government. Greater Manchester has previously done exceptionally well on empty homes in terms of bringing empty homes back into use. Um, that doesn't mean it is off the agenda here within Greater Manchester. I guess what I'm drawing attention to is at the moment the government does not have an initiative nationally which we can tap into to actually do some of that work and incentivise that, that agenda. Um, what I would say as well is it's, it's quite difficult if empty homes are in private ownership. 
you know, the assumption there potentially is that all of these homes are, are either social homes or council homes. Well, that simply isn't the case because we know at the moment, speaking with registered providers within Greater Manchester, that turnover within their properties and within their stock is at an absolute all-time low. So dealing with private homeowners on this agenda is actually quite complex, costly, and certainly will require some public money to actually get the resources in place and also build a team and the capacity within local government and the combined authority to forge ahead with that. That doesn't mean to say that that is off the agenda, and I think that's something we can certainly pick up through the Greater Manchester Housing Strategy. This is a vision document. This isn't an operational plan. So let's wait for the strategy and the operational plan that will be associated with that, because I'm absolutely with you on this. I wouldn't want to lose sight of the importance of thinking how we tackle empty homes within Greater Manchester. And it's something I do often speak to the officers about in terms of whether or not we can push government to potentially come forward through a devolution ask maybe around how we tackle empty homes within Greater Manchester moving forward. I think you're absolutely right on, on the older population in terms of them living in their, their homes for 20, 30, 35 years and the memories that are very much embedded in those homes and those communities and the reluctance inevitably as a consequence of that to, to consider moving out. I'm not advocating that we, we push people out of their homes and out of those spaces where memories matter to them. This is about working with older people to see if they want to consider alternative solutions. It's about, you know, it's not about forcing an agenda here, and, and I would never advocate that. In terms of decent homes, you'll be aware as well in the green paper that the government have announced on social housing, government have committed to potentially reviewing the decent home standard nationally in the country. So that is something we're currently considering and working with housing leads across the 10 districts um, in terms of inputting into that consultation. The government are currently running on decent homes and its future. Decent homes for me though, obviously is time limited, things move on. We're talking about zero carbon homes these days. We're talking about insulation, we're talking about reducing or improving energy efficiency within homes. So decent homes as a standard also needs to move with the times as the industry continues to change. So I think it's right and proper that we use the green paper consultation to consider where we go nationally in terms of a decent home standard for for the country and Greater Manchester will be fully participating in that consultation. Councillor Booth, please. Thank you, Chair. I'll start with a comment, if I may. Um, 1.3, the strategy that I identify as safe, decent and affordable, I do wish it would say safe, decent, affordable and accessible because I think that is quite important, not just a comment from me. But my question is, we, I have touched on the perhaps the unintended consequences when we move towards higher density communities. And as the chair will know, in our borough, we are, we've got a vision for huge blocks of apartments to be built. I've mentioned gentrification as a possible consequence in a previous meeting, but um, the opposite of that, I'm just a little bit concerned, having been born in Moss Side and seeing what happened in Hume when they had to demolish everything. There was also an estate, I think, built in Sheffield in the 1960s that had this fantastic vision of this lovely community mm. and basically ended up being a sort of ghetto. Yeah. I'm just, I'm, I'm not worried, but I'd just like your thoughts on how we make sure that we learn from the past and we don't, you know, create a potential problem in the future. Other than that, I found this really, really interesting report to read. Um, the first one on accessible, please don't think that that has been missed out at all. I, it might not be in the strap line in terms of the Greater Manchester strategy, but I just draw your attention to 3.6 on our vision, and the first bullet point there does talk about physical accessibility of properties. It is very much part of our thinking in terms of how we, we take that forward. In terms of higher density and, and the threat or concerns around gentrification, you know, I also share your concerns on that, and if you've read anything where I've been commenting in, in, in press articles, you'll see that, you know, I have my own thoughts about that. Um, higher density is important, though. It's important for a number of reasons. We know through the consultation on the Greater Manchester Spatial Framework, those 27,000 responses 
we received from the people of Greater Manchester talked about the absolute importance of green spaces and, and green belt. So higher density is the way that we can meet our objectively assessed housing need numbers that the government have obviously set for us without having to release land in, in the green belt. So it's a way, in a sense, of protecting the green belt. I also think, you know, we can do higher density in good ways. You know, I'm aware in, in certainly my city in Salford where we've done high density um, family homes actually close to the city centre, not necessarily high rise living, um, and, and people have wanted to move into them straight away. So they've been a great success. Um, my concern around all of this, and it, it continues to be my concern, is the affordability of all of this. You know, the bottom line here is we've got a government that is fundamentally committed to the market as being the primary driver of meeting housing need in this country. And even if you look at version two of the National Planning Policy Framework, you can see that, you know, developer interests are protected over a real interventionist approach to meeting housing need in 21st century Britain. Viability assessments trump local policy frameworks when it comes to decisions that planning committees up and down the country have to take. And time and time again in areas of Greater Manchester where land values and property values aren't the same as they are in the south of the country in the city of London, developers are continually turning around to us and saying schemes are not viable. Therefore, contributions to affordable housing or Section 106 agreements quite often are not there. So from my point of view, government had an opportunity in the latest version of the National Planning Policy Framework to actually tackle this issue. Unfortunately, in my assessment of version two of the National Planning Policy Framework, I don't think they did that. And every planning committee up and down the country has to take decisions in conformity to the National Planning Policy Framework. So, you know, if, I, if you want me to be political, we need to change the National Planning Policy Framework. And if the government is unwilling to do that, we need to change the government to actually address the issues you're raising. Uh, Councillor Robinson, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's on your empty, empty home statement, Paul. Um, over five years ago, we had about 3,000 empty properties. We're now down to under 800. But you're right where it comes to resources and how we fund it. As we've all had cuts made in our councils, Rochdale's over 200 million we've had of cuts to our bor borough. So we've condensed our staff down to work in partnership with other parts of the housing areas, like the homeless, so they're all working together. But we are now down to a skeleton crew that's been condensed that much to get into the nitty gritty of these eight, under 800 landlords, as we want to call them, um, to work with us, as half of them don't even live in this country. Um, and that is going to be difficult, but we, like, like you said, Paul, we need the funding because our resources in our but it is in the way of staff. Uh, and unless we've got the staff, we can't carry on with the job. Absolutely. And that's the point I've been trying to make, is all of this requires resources, human resources, skilled people, money in local authorities' budgets, all of which we know is under attack as a consequence of a government's commitment to austerity, which disproportionately plays out in local government as a part of the state, but also even worse than that, disproportionately plays out in the north of the country from numerous analyses I've actually seen. I mean, Cambridge University only recently published in The Guardian and also in some academic journals, the territorial injustices they refer to it as, basically pitting local authorities against each other and highly politicizing local government financing. You know, we've got a government at the moment that is talking about negative revenue support grant. What that actually means is stuffing money into the shires where people vote conservative quite often. It's an absolute disgrace what is happening with regards to local government financing. And we need reforms urgently to address many of the issues you're talking about. So thanks for raising that. 
Okay, I'll move us on. Uh, I think we can all agree if we're not trying to overthrow the government, what is any of us doing here? So, um, and for those of you who are playing scrutiny committee bingo, a call to overthrow the government there, you've got... You I said replace, not overthrow. <laughs> <laughs> I believe in the electoral process. Very good, very good. That's always reassuring to hear from an elected member. Okay, I'll yeah. move us on. I'll move us on to item six, uh, which is the homelessness update, a highly relevant... Uh, follow-on item. Members will recall that we, in, or members who've been on the committee for a while will recall that in March we had a really, really interesting session when we went over to the fire training uh, centre and we heard from practitioners in this field. We made some recommendations to the combined authority and this item is a follow-up from that six months on from making those recommendations. Mayor Dennett, are you making, yeah. uh, are you introducing this? Go ahead. Do you not want me to speak to this chair? <laughs> <laughs> Briefly, if you would. Uh, okay, I'll try and be, I'll try and be brief. Um, th there's a lot in here, though, by the way. Uh, okay, so we'll start, first of all, with gi giving you a quick um, canter through the various initiatives that form Greater Manchester's approach to tackling homelessness and, and rough sleeping. So, first of all, I'll talk to you a little bit about the social impact bond. Currently, we have 112 people in accommodation and 32 people at the last count actually had an offer of accommodation so most of those will have probably moved into accommodation now. As you'll remember in early August we actually paused the social impact bond in terms of um, referrals through to it in Greater Manchester because we had 500 and 26 referrals into the scheme. This was nowhere near the number we had originally budgeted for when we asked government um, for money to actually implement the initiative. Government have obviously seen um, the ref number of referrals and we've been reporting into government about that. And last month, government kindly gave us another 829,000 pounds towards the social impact bond scheme here in Greater Manchester, taking the financial total now to 2.629 million within Greater Manchester. The scheme is highly successful. Government acknowledged that, which is arguably why they've given us an another over 800,000 to, to crack on with that work. Um, in addition to that, you'll notice in, in the paper the reference to housing first. And as of the 2nd of October this month, we've actually gone out to tender on our housing first model here in Greater Manchester. Greater Manchester is one of three city regions in the country to have been successful in downloading some monies from government to implement housing first. We've been awarded eight million pounds to do this work. You'll be aware that this is around accommodation, but also in-depth support for approximately 400 individuals with complex needs and exclusions. And that is going to be in place over a three-year period. Um, government are piloting Housing First, which is only why there's three city regions, in a sense, who've been successful with some of this funding. Um, I think there are asks, certainly in the public domain, from various meetings I've attended and certainly the, the housing network um, and the homelessness network um, to actually roll out this approach to tackling homelessness and rough sleeping across the whole of the country. In addition to that, we've been successful with trailblazer funding, and in the report you'll be aware that there is an action plan attached, and that obviously goes across six themes and supports the work of the Homelessness Action Network and processes around the Homelessness Reduction Act. I mean, it's been very, very successful in terms of us realising a common approach within Greater Manchester to implementing the new duties within the Homelessness Reduction Act. And that includes a common ICT system, common approaches to training. And what you've got there is a 10-year strategy to, to move forward, supporting the Homelessness Action Network in terms of tackling homelessness within Greater Manchester, supported by Trailblazer funding. I think the big news in the update for colleagues in the room is winter provision and Greater Manchester's commitment to a bed every night. And that's between the 1st of November and the 31st of March. And in a sense, what we'll be doing now is dispensing with the SWEP protocol, the emergency protocol, where if an individual is sleeping rough for three consecutive nights and the temperature over each of those nights is below zero, then we ensure they have accommodation. We're dispensing with that, and what we're committing to 
is a bed every night within Greater Manchester from the 1st of November up until the 31st of March, which I think is a fantastic testament to the work of Greater Manchester, the 10 districts and the leaders in those councils in terms of working with the combined authority and Mayor Burnham to actually realise this, this initiative. It's going to cost probably around between two and 2.5 million pounds. And that's the difference between what it costs currently under the SWEP protocol and this further commitment to ensure that we have a bed every night in, in Greater Manchester. As part of the winter provision, we'll also be looking at accommodation for certainly people with protected <coughs> characteristics, specifically younger people and, and, and women as well in all of that. So if there are any technical questions on on the report, I'm sure Mike is happy to, to answer those, but that's just a quick canter through around Greater Manchester's approach across the 10 districts and with the combined authority to tackling homelessness and rough sleeping. Thank you very much. This is a huge issue that we could spend a whole meeting on, but we're not going to. A um, couple of quick questions from me. The funding seems to be quite fragmented and funding is key to being able to deliver um, what I think everybody in this room, everybody in Greater Manchester will want. Um, in terms of outcomes for the people that this, that this report is talking about. So if you could talk about how uh, funding is going to be secured, how you see it being secured, particularly given the relationship between the combined authority and the 10 boroughs. Also, you talked about the action plan, uh, and it says in here that because of the very, very late receipt of funding from government, all of that's had to be kicked back a bit. So just an outline of roughly what sort of timing we're thinking about. And then the mayor... Uh, of Greater Manchester talked in his election campaign about eliminating rough sleeping by 2020. And I just, without um, wishing to um, cause mischief, uh, to see if you thought we were on track to, to deliver that. Um, the first one on fragmented funding. Well, in a sense, we can thank the government for the fragmented nature of funding um, at the moment, certainly for city regional combined authorities, but also local government. And again, just to re-issue re, um, my, my point earlier, you know, let's not forget that we wouldn't necessarily be in this predicament had it not been for the cuts that local authorities have seen and the lack of supported accommodation now that exists at a district and local level as a consequence of austerity and local government cuts. I think the ongoing devolution ask that we referenced in the housing vision is an opportunity to raise again the importance of tackling rough sleeping and homelessness, being mindful that the government are also working to a totally different time frame to Greater Manchester. They want to halve rough sleeping and then end it by 2027. Andy Burnham is committed to ending the need for rough sleeping by 2020. Um, so in terms of tackling the fragmented funding issue, I think that's a question for the government, if I'm being perfectly honest with you. And that isn't to sideline the issue. We will always apply for money as and when it becomes available. But governments seem to be intent on taking money out of local authorities and running these kind of national initiatives, forcing either combined authorities or local authorities to apply and engage in almost competitive tender with each other to actually download some of that money which they've taken off us in the first place. Um, in terms of the question around the, the action plan and whether or not we're on track to, to meet Andy's ambition around ending the need for rough sleeping by 2020, I think I'll hand over to the officer who deals with this on a day-to-day -day basis within the combined authority, Mike Wright, to, to answer those operational questions. Thanks, Paul. Thanks for that. Um, <laughs> um, before I answer the second question, I just want to check if we're being televised. Yeah. We are, okay. Yeah, we're absolutely on track to meet Andy's commitment. <laughs> uh, I'm supremely confident we will do it. Actually, no, I am actually. Uh, and I think the, the, the programme for winter actually is part of uh, a ratcheting up of what we've done uh, each year. So last year, uh, Paul was absolutely right. The, the severe weather was, was three nights at zero. We didn't do that. We did one night at zero, which was more than we had to do. This year we're doing even more again than we have to do. And actually what we'll start to see um, is, is a momentum behind lots and lots of activity. And the, the point of a bed every night is, is that we had people who were in and out of accommodation last year. And when we did feedback, both from local authorities and from partners in the voluntary sector, what they said was that discouraged people from coming in because if they were going to be in for a couple of nights and then out again, they didn't see the point of bothering. 
was actually we had contact with lots of people in accommodation, but we didn't have them for long enough to do something meaningful with them, and that's the critical difference this year. Um, we will have people coming back through winter provision this year who were in winter provision last year, and that is a terrible testament to, to, to lack of missed opportunity in terms of working with people. Uh, just in terms of the, the action plan, yeah, we, uh, we received our first tranche of money on the 28th of March this year. Um, clearly, we have actually been doing things uh, prior to that, so things like the common IT system, the common training for staff, and development around the Homelessness Reduction Act, we just got on with and did anyway at risk um, because the, the date of the act being implemented was fixed at the 1st of April. We had to do it anyway. So we just got on and did that, and actually that's been really, really successful. What we'll do, because uh, one of the recommendations in the report is to bring back a regular, regular uh, update, is I'm happy to, to update um, committee members with the, the updated action plan and timeline. Thank you. It's good when uh, we all remember this is more than just a housing issue, so much more than just a housing issue. Okay, I've got questions from Councillors Wilson, then Walker, Gunther, then Booth. Councillor Wilson, please. Thanks, Chair, and uh, thank you for the report. There's some very encouraging um, things uh, going on, um, particularly looking forward to the um, seeing how the implementation of Housing First works, because I know it's been very successful where it's um, how, um, been piloted elsewhere. Um, and just uh, after some more information on the homelessness prevention um, trail uh, laser, um, one of the uh, officers who works in homelessness in Manchester says that uh, for every 10, uh, 10 people we get off the street, there are 12 people replacing them because of um, the impacts of things like um, the, the punitive benefit sanctions, roll out of universal credits as well as a uh, lack of services because of uh, cuts to local government. Um, so, I mean, this is a, a, a big area which doesn't really get much public a attention. So, um, I mean, the report talked a lot about the outcomes that we want to see. I just wanted to, it wondered if you could have a bit, a bit of, put a bit of meat on the bones as to what the services will actually look like when this is um, um, underway and what, what what sort of things we we want those services to be doing in terms of like yeah just just what what it will look like on the ground essentially yes yeah, certainly the within the action plan there are, we divided up a little bit into six specific themes originally housing first was one but that's now a clearly a separate a separate program the the point of the trailblazers if you like was to promote prevention um, which is i think everyone would agree is is the best way of dealing with homelessness, but actually prevent it happening in the first place. And it very specifically tries to tackle demand and also supply, um, because you're absolutely right. And supply is one of the things that is hugely constrained for this client group, uh, particularly around affordability, around the level of private sector rents, but also uh, things which kind of get missed sometimes within welfare reform, such as the, the, the failure to uprate local housing allowance. So the gap between LHA and rents is growing, which makes everything even more unaffordable year on year. And there is actually more to come until 2020. Um, so uh, in terms of um, tackling kind of demand, what we're looking to do is, is to promote the best practice. We have got some really good practice in this region around prevention, particularly around things like um, mediation services, pre-eviction protocols for private landlords and from social landlords preventing eviction, which ironically um, assists with the, the, the low turnover in social housing, but at least we're keeping people, keeping people where they are. Um, and tackling, getting people into other services. So actually, because um, the chair was absolutely right, um, homelessness quite often isn't actually just a housing issue, it's quite often a social need issue. And one of the biggest issues that we're dealing with at the moment is the lack of supported accommodation, which was always a safety net for many people within this client group. And we've lost a lot of that um, within Greater Manchester. So we're working on how we can develop that um, through some of the, the things in the National Rural Sleeper Strategy. So we want to promote best practice. We also want to promote consistency of practice um, because people under the new Act have a, have a right to present to any local authority. We want people to get a consistency of approach in Greater Manchester and also something that's focused on outcomes, which isn't homeless application. Homeless application is not an outcome in itself. We've kind of moved towards that. I think the reality, I think, is the one that you've absolutely picked up, is that we've actually, over the period that... that uh, Mayor Dennett was talking about increased homeless prevention activity in Greater Manchester by 129%. And despite that, we still had an increase in homeless acceptances of 85%. So 
So our prevention activity is getting better and better and better, and we continue to do that. And as individual authorities lose resources, we want them to, to, to take on the best that other people are doing. But actually, there may still be a gap. We just, it just won't be as big as it would have been had we not done it. Very specifically, though, um, things like the, the Longford Centres uh, has had a contribution from the prevention uh, uh, trailblazer, and we're currently um, uh, identifying a, uh, an approach around uh, accessing good quality, affordable private rented accommodation managed uh, through third parties, which both for prevention and also for discharging homelessness duty, and we'd hope to have an outcome on that fairly soon. I can't talk about it at the moment because that's quite a sensitive discussion, but that will hopefully address the supply issue. Um, I, I think you're absolutely right to, to, to raise these questions and I'm sure Mike's illustrated that operationally we will do what we can as a combined authority working with the 10 districts but I think we mustn't forget yes homelessness and, and rough sleeping is absolutely not just a housing issue and I think we all accept a, a, and understand that but we've also got to also accept that homelessness and rough sleeping is the symptom of a failing system. And what I mean by that is society and life for many people has actually become an awful lot more precarious. Look at the housing market in tatters. Government acknowledges it's broken. Look at what's happening on welfare reform, the rollout of universal credit, people moving in and out of jobs, having to wait for benefit payments, racking up debt, rent arrears, council tax arrears. Look at cuts to local government. By the end of this next financial year, we will have seen 50% of our revenue budget in Salford gone. And then look at the labour market and the precarious nature of employment with zero hour contracts, low pay. Homelessness and rough sleeping is a symptom of a failing system. And what it requires is a systems-based approach to how we tackle this. It is about the antecedents, but it's about the system itself taking a good hard look at itself and actually reforming itself in the interests of the people we all seek to serve and represent. Okay, I'm gonna take the next uh, three questions together. So I've got Councillor Walker, Councillor Gunther, Councillor Booth, please. Uh, first of all, one of the things we learned from meeting those practitioners back in March or whenever it was, was that this magic number seems to be only the tip of the iceberg. So I think you quoted a figure of 200 and whatever it was uh, earlier. Um, and part of the reality from those people was that there are a lot more than that figure. One of the lessons we've learned from that at Wigan is we now count monthly. Because it, you know, the once a year that the government requires is not, it's not good enough, to be honest. And, and it really depends on weather and, and lots of other things, whether you are actually able to count them. But however you try and do it, it will never be that accurate. Uh, <clears throat> so I just wanted to flag up that. Um, so it's, you, um, and in fact, some of your referrals, like the 500 plus referrals that you stopped at, that tells me, if those are professionals making those referrals, then that already tells me that we've got at least double whatever the, you know, the magic figure is that we, we've been told is, is the correct figure. But can I just have a, a, a little word of warning as well? Because um, one, we've, in my, on the boundary of my ward in Wigan, we've just opened uh, a unit literally in the last three months um, and it's it's amazing because of course as the local councillors we know that we're the first to hear about any issues now before we'd actually moved anybody in we'd opened it one day but we hadn't moved anyone in and lo and behold we're getting complaints from you know because all the problems of the area are suddenly created by, in their head, this, this place full of, of homeless people, but there's none of them in there. And this, our homeless unit, is, is much more than, and, and I hope, you know, it's the future of homeless units. It's not about just a shelter. 
It's a lot more than that. It's about dealing with the problem. I think the point that the that the mayor made uh, earlier that that you know <coughs> you don't just shelter people. You've got to deal with the problems and give them the support. But just be aware of that and don't automatically, because I'm I'm sort of believing people, and I just want to warn people. Find out the true facts because you will they'll become the the this the focal point for every moan about drugs, needles, all the other antisocial stuff that we've all got in our in different bits of our ward. So a word of warning. Thank you, Councillor Walker. Councillor Gunther, please. I have trouble with this. Um, yes, just a couple of points. Firstly, I wonder if there are any figures available uh, as, as far as rough sleepers are concerned, as far as gender, whether th there is a breakdown, whether there are... Because I would have thought... I know rough sleeping is dreadful anyway, but I would have thought it was more dangerous for a woman than for a man, so that, that's one point. Right. What I really want to say to you all is... Last year, during my mayorality, I was informed by a very high-profile person in Manchester, and this applies to Manchester, and um, you have brought, uh, Councillor Dennis has brought politics into this meeting, and so I'm going to say it was said to me by a member of your party and not mine, right? And what he said was, are you aware that Manchester has made accommodation available for all rough sleepers. My reaction to that was, I can't imagine anybody sleeping in a doorway if there is any alternate. The reply to that was, but you're not on drugs. I would like clarification on that, if possible. And depending on your answer, I'm, I'm quite happy to challenge the, the author of the statement. Right. The the other thing I want to, the other thing I want to say is, um, how do we intend to solve the problems? Because these people have other problems as well. And I'm uh, sorry. What I want to know is, if people aren't safe in hostel, if people don't feel safe in hostels, then why why don't they feel safe in hostels? And isn't that a question that we should be addressing? As a, as an add-on to that. Uh, I was in Bolton earlier this year, coming back from the mayoral ball, and there was somebody camped on the pavement, and it was a filthy night. There was somebody camped on the pavement outside the new bus station. And my driver said to me, that's so-and-so in there. He feels safe in there. He doesn't feel safe in a hostel. So why, whether we call this item in, I would like to know why people don't feel safe in hostels. And if they don't, how can we sort that out? The, the other issue is these, prob these people, very unfortunately, do have other problems. And if you, <clears throat> if you put them in ordinary accommodation, if you were if, in an ideal world, if we were able to accommodate them all in, in, in flats, houses, or whatever, we are councillors. We see the other side of that. We know if you get somebody who has antisocial habits, we will get the complaints. This is a right guy. You put it. Oh, this is a right person. You put in this place after me. That's causing all this disruption. Is that not a fact? So, if you could just address those issues. Well, I'm not sure any of us was expecting a mayoral car to feature this evening, this, this morning, <laughs> Councillor Gunther. <laughs> Councillor Booth, please. Yes, thank you, Chair. It's really a following on from what you said, that, that very pertinent point that you made, and then Paul followed on, about this is more than just homelessness. And when I was reading the report, something struck me that had occurred to me about a different cohort of people um, when I was previously employed, and it was when you were talking about the housing first and prevention of home homelessness, I wondered how you identified certain groups that might be prone to homelessness. The reason I'm asking this was I used to be a special welfare case officer within the child support agency. And while what I'm telling you is not gender specific, it does disproportionately affect men that when the relationship breaks down and they have to leave the home, 
they have to find somewhere else to live, they have to pay child support, etc. They have the emotional trauma, they might be prevented from seeing the children. Sadly, I actually had a case of a gentleman in the southwest of England, and whilst it wasn't just because he was paying child support, it was due to him not being able to afford his home, he went onto a school playing field and hung himself. Now, that haunts me to this day, but it is that, it's that cross-system that is sort of breaking down. And for me, that is a cohort that is not always given the help and the support and the attention. I don't want to go on and on about it, but I'm just wondering, how do you identify the different cohorts? Because it's not all people that have drug and alcohol problems. There are many, many people that end up homeless. There's a lot in there. <laughs> yeah, there is. Uh, do you want to start, yeah, Mayor Dennett? Absolutely. So, um, first of all, um, responding to Councillor Walker um, in terms of this only being tip, the tip of the iceberg in terms of the numbers, I think you're absolutely right to draw attention to the official rough sleepers count, which quite often local authorities up and down the country only do once per year. Interesting to hear in Wigan's case, you're doing that much more frequently. Um, the number that I quoted to you is the official rough sleepers count. Um, what we know, certainly from the work that Mike does, working across all the districts across Greater Manchester, is that we probably have between 400 and 500 people habitually sleeping rough on our streets. So it is more than the 268 I quoted in terms of the official statistical returns we, we make to government. The question on gender, I think, emerged off the back of this. I think it was Councillor Gunter who asked that. We do know that from the data we've got currently in Greater Manchester, 86% of our rough sleepers are male, which kind of refers to the point that Councillor Booth just made about this disproportionately affecting men within, within society, meaning that there's the 14% female. Um, in terms of... The other questions, I think some of them I can't answer. So the question you raised about your interactions with a Manchester councillor, I think. Um, I'm not privy to that information, so I'm more than happy for you to share that with me and for me to investigate that further. But I wouldn't want to be commenting on matters pertaining to Manchester City Council and not necessarily my work and my brief as the lead um, in the combined authority. Um, I, th I don't think that's right or proper, if I'm honest with you, um, especially as I'm not directly accountable nor involved in, in whatever was, was said to you at that time. I do think you do highlight some other issues around safety in host hostels and also general provision. I mean, I, I recently visited um, the Narragate shelter in, in Salford, actually, along with Andy Burnham. And one of the interesting things that the... the people who are running that facility drew my attention to was how they have to be careful about the people who come into the facility. And what I mean by that is they're referred to the facility. Everyone's referred from a whole raft of different people. But if they're really, you know, leery or drunk or they're high on drugs, they, they're not allowed admission to that facility. Now, I know that isn't the case for all facilities across Greater Manchester, but I do think it is a key issue that we need to probably consider operationally how we, we tackle that. So just to reassure you, we are aware of these issues and some of the provision already within Greater Manchester is aware of these issues and has taken decisions to obviously tackle some of those, those problems. But I think from a kind of human perspective, I think we should do all we can to make sure um, that everyone has a roof over their head within society and aren't sleeping rough on our streets or encamped on pavements in tents. I do accept the point you make about how that makes individuals feel within settings in terms of not personally feeling safe. And I think we just have to work with the system we've got at the moment with a view to obviously improving some of that and making sure that all that wraparound service is actually in place, be that you know drug and alcohol services, mental health services. It's very much trying to replicate the housing first model across the whole of the system to ensure that we put the people of Greater Manchester absolutely at the heart of what we're doing. But I guess for me, you, you know, you say I brought politics into this. Well, I won't apologize for this because I don't actually think you can escape politics in modern day Britain. I think politics influences and impacts on everything we do. And especially when we're talking about the public sector 
And that's what we're talking about here in many respects, is the role of the combined authority and the role of local authorities in terms of tackling homelessness and rough sleeping. Inevitably, you will never be able to escape politics. So I don't apologize for bringing politics in, into this because I want to deal with reality. And reality, unfortunately, in some respects, is highly, highly political. Um, I think Mike probably is better responding to the points that Councillor Booth made around, you know, what we can do to improve the system. And, you know, thanks for sharing us, you know, the story you've shared about the gentleman who, who sadly lost his life, because that is tragic. And, you know, we need to take account of those stories to improve how we deliver services and make sure that, you know, human life sits at the heart of everything we do. In, in Greater Manchester. But I don't know if Mike wants to respond to some of the operational learning, I think, that probably we could take from that. Yeah, um, I mean, just to... It, it was absolutely sets out why we're doing this, I think. that I mean, nationally, um, data, the average age of death for a, a male rough sleeper is 43, and for a female rough sleeper is 47. And I think if that doesn't tell us why we should be doing this, then nothing does. There was certainly a report, I think it was all over Channel 4 News last night, um, around recording of homeless deaths, at least 400, at least 449 um, rough sleepers died on the streets of England in the previous 12 months. That's an underreporting of that figure. Um, so actually, when we talk about things like hostels and a bed every night and this and the other, we're actually talking quite literally about life and death for, for people within our within our region. And I think that's why we're so committed to doing it. Um, you're absolutely right. <laughs> Oh, sorry. You're absolutely right, sorry, uh, around the issues of, of prediction. Um, and what you think you talk about is, is triggers. What we know is that there are trigger events in people's lives which for which you can trace back what led to something, whether that's um, uh, adverse childhood experiences, it might be debt, it might break up a relationship, and that, that does seem to affect, affect men more. It was actually, it's very, very early, there was a, a, an event yesterday um, uh, with local government information unit around looking at how we can bring in predictive modelling to get people um, primarily focused around debt actually uh, and the impact of welfare reform but actually where that will enable us to intervene earlier almost before people have come to us at crisis um, and that's something that we uh, emailed out the 10 local authorities this morning about who we might be interested in that and I'm happy to again to bring that back. Thank you. We've, I've, Councillor Robinson hasn't contributed yet so if you could briefly make a point and then we'll move on. I'll wrap us up and move us on to the next item. Thank you, Chair. As the, the Chair of the Homeless Forum in, in Rochdale, I visit not just the units, but we've changed the names from soup, from soup kitchens to community kitchens because there's a stigma around, uh, around soup kitchens uh, and people will not attend them. So, and the community groups that do this volunteering are, uh, are, are grateful that we have changed that name. A number of issues when I do the visits, and I do them at least twice a year, and there's 12 at the moment, um, is when families have to be split up because maybe domestic violence and young mums have to go into sheltered accommodation. Their mental health problems tenfold because they don't get to see their children. I am trying to address that now at the moment. So it's not just a case about men being on the street. It's the mental health effect of people that may be going on the street for various reasons and having to be put into temporary accommodation and in mixed units. And some young women um, don't feel safe because they're in a mixed unit with men. So that's another issue to take up. Um, on, on an, on, on, uh, like Mike, I watched that program last night on Channel 4 regarding homelessness. And it was Homeless Awareness Day yesterday, um, and interviewing people. And it was all men on the streets that they were interviewing. I didn't see any women being interviewed whatsoever. There are various ways to tackle this. And one way that we're trying to do it now is making people, I think, they're going to be made homeless, aware of Section 21. Now, all my community groups that we meet, it's called Brains in Rochdale, and all the volunteer groups we all meet, they're all going to get a copy of that Section 21 notice so they can take it out to those that are at risk of losing their homes. Okay, um, thank you very much for that, Councillor Robinson. Um, I think the point you made about community kitchen, kitchens is a really good one um, because, you know, I'm acutely aware that even people with a roof over their head are actually choosing between heating and eating in 21st century Britain. So this isn't just about 
a provision for homeless people or rough sleepers. It is about, as you rightly say, kitchens that are targeting people in real destitution and poverty, which, you know, in many respects, again, back to Maslow's hierarchy, is a scourge on modern Britain. This should fundamentally not be happening in one of the wealthiest economies in the world if we're to call ourselves a, a civilised society. I think the point you make about mixed units and some of the issues that arise out of that, I did try to cover some of that in my update on, on the paper because it is something we're thinking about across the various initiatives from the trailblazer to the bed every night to the social impact bond and, and housing first. We are looking at how we address some of those issues as well, as well as working with some of the supported accommodation that's already out in the system that local authorities and others obviously control. So this is about a system-based approach to deal with many of the issues that you're, you're raising. And I think Mike responded earlier, because it was a very similar point, I think, that was made um, to Councillor Booth in terms of how do we support men with mental health issues and potentially situations where they can't see their children because of their circumstances. That, again, is informing some of what we're doing within Greater Manchester to try and ensure that this is a system-based approach that has the person very much at the heart of what we do. But thanks for those comments. And on section 21, I, I really agree with you because I don't know if you've noticed, but we've now got a situation nationally where private landlords are saying that if you are on benefits, you're not entitled to apply for accommodation. And we know that the biggest cause of homelessness is the issuing of Section 21 notices where people are evicted from their homes. So this is raising some real issues in terms of the role of the private rented sector moving forward in terms of them working with us to try and tackle these issues because at the moment some of this activity clearly suggests that they're working against the ambitions of Greater Manchester to ensure that we meet our targets. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much to everybody who contributed there. It's clearly an item that has huge interest levels amongst the committee, and we would welcome this item coming on future agendas at the appropriate time. So thank you very much. Thank you very okay, much. moving us on. Congestion deal, item 6A. This is in the, a report in the name of Andy Burnham and John Lamont, neither of whom are in this room. Um, but I'm looking over at that corner of the table, and you look like likely subjects to be talking on this item. Is that right? Correct. Good morning. Good uh, morning. I Please uh, take up to 10 minutes to talk us through this. We'll be brief, very Please, brief. Please, thank you very much. Go ahead. OK. Uh, we all know how high congestion is on everybody's agenda. Um, back in March, when the congestion deal was launched, there was an initial budget of 1.5 million allocated, of which half a million was for resource, to become a 24-7 operation so we could get, manage the morning and evening peaks better and also to manage key corridors within Greater Manchester and to set some context behind that. Of the key corridors, they take up 7% of the overall road space in Greater Manchester. Of that 7% in the morning peak, two-thirds of all GM traffic uses 7% of the roads. So they are very heavily congested. We all know the impact of that. There was also one million uh, allocated for highway interventions. Um, that was uh, at the start, a stab at where we needed to be. We hadn't got the detail behind it, but we knew it was that order of magnitude. So to bring you up to speed on those two items, we were slow in the recruitment of the control center corridor managers. That was because we really struggled to find the right calibre of resource. There are not many of these type of individuals around who can think multimodally, because solving congestion isn't just about building more roads. It's about getting people off the roads, onto public transport, walking, cycling. And to get somebody who had that breadth of knowledge has proved quite a challenge, but we've done that. The good thing is we've been able to release another £150,000 worth due to the delay, and we'll use that on physical interventions around the local authorities. After the review of the initial interventions, and by that we were talking about, well, can we trim a curb here? Do we need to reinforce white lining? Do we need better signage? What we did realize is that to manage the bulk of the traffic, we needed better data and better visibility of our corridors. Because if they don't work, it just becomes gridlock somewhere else. So we worked with the 10 local authorities we're identifying the congestion hotspots, and we're basically going to put better eyes and ears 
out there. More cameras, more data coming in. We all use Google Maps um, at some point in, in our day. The younger generation take that as the norm now. So we've really got to hook up onto that data and identify where the real pinch points are. That will then be used to plan the interventions in the local authorities. Where do we need to really target the hotspots? The danger is you target a hotspot in isolation and then it displaces it to the next junction down the route. So we've got to look at it on a corridor basis, hence the reason for the data. Um, and this, to be honest, this system will provide the basis of travel behaviour change because that's the key factor in solving congestion. So that's a, a bit of background to the report. So we're slightly using the funds in a different way, but a far more effective way. Happy to take any questions, Chair. Ten points for brevity. Thank you for that. Um, this item links in with so many of the other things this committee looks at. And recently we've had uh, a presentation on air quality and some of the work that is going to have to be done to address some of those air quality hotspots. Um, I wonder if you could talk about how this work is sitting alongside that. There has been some press in the MEN recently on some of the potential proposals of addressing that. And I wonder if you could just talk to that. Yes, certainly. Um, we know that transport's one of the main causes of poor air quality, uh, particularly road traffic and particularly the M60. We're in a big area now. We don't have direct control on the M60, but we do have the other key corridors. So we're running two projects. As you know, we're now responsible for delivering the clean air. So we're trying to bring those two together wherever possible. So you'll see reference in this document about we might provide some AMPR cameras. Well, actually, are we better waiting until we know what we're doing in the clean air? Because we may need a lot more AMPR-type cameras, automatic number plate recognition, so we can see who the dirty cars are and what we can do about them. So the, there are areas that it'll touch, but actually solve congestion, you're a long way to starting to solve clean air. And then just one more question from me before I throw it open. Anybody as a local councillor who signs off any um, anything to do with highways knows that this amount of money is not going to go very far. Are we being ambitious enough? This is the starting point. Um, given the budget constraints we've all faced in the last couple of years and continue, this is the start to really get where we need to be. Thank you. Somebody was waving to me from over there. Please go ahead. I've done it. Right. Um, I'm not sure if it comes under this remit, so apologies if it doesn't. But um, related to this is aspects of park and ride and the use of the metro, because there are hot spots across GM where people are just flagrantly going against any kind of highway parking regulations or whatever, causing a lot of problems for the local people in locality to the metro. And there doesn't seem to be any joined up thinking as to how this all works, because obviously if you want less cars coming in, then you want a better organized deal for park and ride and everything associated with that. Will, this, will that come under this remit? It won't directly come under the congestion remit, but it comes under the remit of TFGM. Um, one of the things we are keen to do is to get people out of the cars, uh, the furthest away from their destination as possible to use public transport. Uh, take, for instance, look at Radcliffe um, as a park and ride, where we know every time we increase that facility, it attracts more people, which is great from a congestion and clean air point of view. But once the park and ride becomes full, then what happens is those motorists then start to spread over into the local area. We've had to do traffic measures around there, and we will continue to the work with the local authorities. We're a victim of a success in some ways, but we can't ignore that. The best way is to provide more out-of-town park and ride facilities wherever we can. Thank you. As a Radcliffe councillor, that is very welcome. Councillor Walker, I think you were waving at me, weren't you? Yeah. I'll, only a simple one. The, the, the point you made about the cameras. Just a word of warning, because it can hang on forever. If you, because the truth is, there's 12 million things 
we need the everything monitored. So uh, make sure it doesn't become an excuse for doing nothing. That's all I'd say. Good motto for life there from Councillor Walker, I think. It's worth it, but out of the population of the cameras that we're looking to use with this money, there's only about 5% were down for AMPR because we recognise that. Thank you. Councillor Robinson, please. Just a quick one, Chair. Um, I know this is about get, getting the people on buses and on public <coughs> transport and, and the way cars basically left at home wherever possible. But when you've got a problem of a, a 10, 15 minute journey taking you 55 minutes on public transport to get to a destination, then we need to look at what the transport is doing first, the public transport, before we can get everybody out of the cars. And this committee knows pretty well, it's horrendous me getting here sometimes and getting home late at night. And uh, the 163 that's supposed to take 10 minutes to get from my house to Berry bus station took 54 minutes this morning. Thank you. Councillor Glover, yeah. could you use your microphone, please? With the using public transport, one of the issues that was raised at a meeting I went to the other day was that you couldn't end up needing a number of passes or tickets in order to get from the different modes of transport. So it's what moves are we actually doing to start to integrate this. I know there's issues with the buses in particular, with all the various franchises and things, but it's what moves are we taking in order to ratify this where you can just get a ticket and you can go from A to B. So you raise an important point, Councillor Glover, and one that this committee's looked at uh, before, I think, before you joined the committee. And I think, no, no, I think it, your intervention is very valid because it links in with so many of the other things that we're doing. And I think Susan and I were just talking about we're probably due an update on that, actually, I think. But, sorry, I don't know if you wanted to address the point that Councillor Glover raised. No, it's a very good point. It's something that we feel very strongly about. We've had some attempts... Um, as you rightly point out, there are over 30 different bus operators in Greater Manchester over which we have no control. They have their own individual schemes. Some have no schemes. Uh, what you will see in the new year, we're starting to roll out a change to the way Metrolink operator go to a, a zonal fare. And we'll also be moving to contactless payment. So we're, we're trying to get there, actually, not to replicate the Oyster card in London, but actually to do something that's more relevant for the residents of Greater Manchester. Um, an update on bus progress is due to come to our next meeting, which I know members will be interested in. OK, as nobody else has indicated, I'll say thank you very much. Um, please do come again to this committee. See it as a default that you come to us before you go to the combined authority. Um, we'd love to feed in. It's an item of real interest to us, so thank you very much. OK. Um, it's all been a warm-up act for waste. David, um, just a word before I bring in David. So members will have noted that we've got a Part A report and a Part B report. My proposal is that we ask David to introduce the Part A report and then we turn off the webcam and we go into Part B because some of the information in Part B is commercially sensitive. And so I propose to take all questions in Part B so we're not then worried about whether we accidentally stray into commercially sensitive things. Is that agreed? Yeah. Agreed. David, five minutes on part A. Thank you, Chair. I will keep this brief. So the report is giving you an update on the procurement of uh, waste services for Greater Manchester. By way of background, the former Greater Manchester Waste Disposal Authority terminated its PFI contract in 2017. To guarantee operational service delivery, the GMWDA entered into a short-term contract with Viridor for provision of services for around 18 months while these new procurements were undertaken to get longer-term arrangements in place. During the course of that, the other change that happened was that GMWDA effectively was wound up. All of its assets, statutory powers, were transferred across to the combined authority as of the 1st of April this year. So that's hence why I'm sat here now talking to you about waste management. So for the procurement process, the decision was taken not to go out for a single contract, but to break it up into three lots, which basically cover the different waste streams and the different facilities that we have. The overall aim of the contract is to drive up 
landfill diversion to over 90%, to increase recycling at the household waste recycling centres to 60% as a minimum, and to achieve an overall recycling rate of 55%. The other key thing that we're looking to achieve is flexibility, because there is uncertainty around what national waste policy will actually be for the future, because the government has delayed uh, publication of its strategy until later this year. So the procurement process started in November 2017. The report sets out the procurement time frame. Where we currently are is in the stages of competitive dialogue with the bidders. And I will cover details of that in the, the Part B report uh, in, in particular. So I think that's as much as I wanted to say just to introduce the, the concept and the background as to why we're doing what we're doing. And thank you very much. I think it's important, given the importance to both the public purse and to many of the other issues we talk about at this committee, that we had a Part A report, which is in public. So thank you very much for that. Before we turn off the webcam, though, um, I've been reminded that we do have a couple of items just to note the work programme, which is towards the back of the papers that we have. Hopefully, colleagues are agreed to note that and that the date and time of the next meeting is Thursday the 15th of November. It's here at 6 p.m. Okay. On that basis, Councillor Gunther. Can I offer my um, apologies for that meeting? Yeah. Thank you, you can, yes. On that basis, we will move to Part B, and we